My name is Peter Shergold, and I am delighted to be here uh, to work on this uh, uh, interesting forum this afternoon. I head up the Centre for Social Impact. I'm joined by my two colleagues, Cheryl Kernow and Les Hems. And this is the third of these forums we have run. We ran similar forums in Sydney and Perth last week and now Melbourne. And there are a number of reasons. In a way, this is a forum that helps CSI to celebrate its third birthday. More importantly, it's to celebrate the launch of our blog a couple of weeks ago. And I not only hope that you will go and read our blogs, we have blogs, new blogs come out every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. This is from uh, today. But I don't just want you to read the blog. I need people to respond, put in a paragraph, because the whole purpose is to try and create um, uh, an interactive uh, vehicle for us. We want you to be part of the CSI uh, interactive family, uh, not just receiving information from us, not just washing, uh, watch, washing us, not just watching us on social business, on uh, Sky Business News, not just coming into our website, but increasingly making use of the blog and now our Twitter site, where I hope you will also follow us. And indeed, today, as in our previous forums, Mei Ling Ho from the centre will be tweeting as this forum goes on to capture the main themes as we're discussing the issues. Now, uh, today we're going to go on as normal, take questions from the floor, but the themes that emerge uh, will be tweeted as we go. Let me now go to the content of this forum. And let me start by suggesting to you three blindingly obvious propositions. The first is that social and community workers make an extraordinarily valuable contribution to Australian society. The disadvantaged clients depend upon their experience and their expertise, their support, perhaps most of all, their empathy. The second proposition is that they are underpaid for what they do. And that makes it hard to attract and then retain workers. We know that many people who work in the community sector do so because they are committed. In the old days when I was an economist, we used to call this psychic income. They didn't get paid much, but they got a lot of psychic value. The trouble is, psychic income isn't something you can actually bank. And the real problem is, as we know, that in that environment, Burnout is an ever-present danger, partly, of course, because of the inadequate resourcing in the sector. And the third proposition is that, to a significant extent, the low wages in the community sector reflect the fact that the workforce is predominantly female. In other words, at a sexual level, gender discrimination is at play. And that's why the wage claim that has been lodged by the Australian Services Union with Fair Work Australia is so important. I put to you, it's probably the most significant equal pay case in Australia for 40 years. And it follows on from the Queensland 2009 equal pay decision. And that decision awarded community workers pay rises of up to 37% over three years, and then the Queensland Government stepped in to provide $414 million worth in funding to help support the community sector organisations meet those increased award rates. So that was Queensland. Now we have the national case before Fair Work Australia. The application was lodged, I think, back in March of last year. It's probably going to be decided as a case around June, July this year. And I can't predict the outcomes, but I'd have a pretty fair guess at what they're likely to be. 
My guess is that more than 150,000 community workers, mainly female, are going to get an award rate increase of 20 to 50 per cent. My guess is probably 30 to 40 per cent over a four to five year transition period. That's my guess of what it's going to be. And then separately, in Western Australia, where we also did this forum last week, uh, the Partnership Forum, it's a partnership forum that I chair, estimates that government funding for community organisations in the West, I'm pretty sure it'll be the same here in Victoria, needs to be boosted by at least 30% if reasonable wages are to be paid. So that's all straightforward. But here's the issue. What happens if a substantial wage increase is awarded, but governments don't match the increase in their grants and their service agreement funding with not-for-profit organisations? You may remember, some of you, back in November, in the newspapers that Julia Gillard started to be accused of doing a backflip because the Commonwealth submission to Fair Work Australia argued that a large catch-up increase in wages for social and community workers could place pressure on government funding to areas like aged care and childcare. And went on to argue if this was the case, if they had to provide more funding in these areas as a result of the outcomes of this wage decision, that could threaten the Commonwealth's commitment to achieving a budgetary surplus and may threaten other areas of government-funded services. And of course, they also indicated that they were concerned if this wage case for social and community workers had a flow on to the other sectors. And it's not surprising that then the key industry advocacy organisations, AIG, Aki and so on, registered similar concerns. I can tell you that some public servants, Commonwealth and state, are saying to me quietly behind closed doors that if government funding does have to be significantly increased, the economics of outsourcing the delivery of human services may become far less attractive even argued that in some instances, insourcing back into the public service might be a better option. But if community organisations don't receive commensurate increased funding, it's clear that many of the organisations represented here are going to be really squeezed. They're going to be put under acute pressure. They're going to have to depend even more than now on philanthropic support and volunteering in order to subsidise their delivery costs. And if you stop just for one moment to think about that, how bizarre is it that we have, in many instances, the not-for-profit sector acting to subsidise governments for the delivery of their programmes and services. So these, I hope you start to see now, are really quite complex and tricky issues. I am really pleased to have uh, such a distinguished panel to discuss this. There's David Thompson uh, from Jobs Australia. I think David and I have a history going back to outsourcing in the old job network some 15 years ago. And I said that I'm now going to tell a very brief story that will embarrass probably him, maybe Cheryl more, because Cheryl came along to one of these conferences and in passing made mention to... Alan Shergold, uh, which we let pass, except that when I then went to speak the next day, David Thompson put on, I think, a Paul Simon number. Uh, call, me Alan. call me Alan, yes. <laughs> so there we uh, We then have uh, uh, Paul Smythe from the Brotherhood of St Lawrence and Julie Edwards from Jesuit Social Services. I'm going to ask each of them just to talk for a couple of minutes because the whole purpose is to then have as much questions and comments as possible and I will remain up here to help uh, field the questions to the right panellists. So, David, over to you. Thank you, Peter, and good afternoon, everyone. I pay our respects to the traditional owners of the land in which we meet and their elders past and present. 
I'm going to quote from something I wrote on the blog, because it sets what I'm about to say in a context. My first foray into industrial relations in the community sector revolved around the then historic 1983 High Court case called the CISOR Social Welfare Case, Community Support Scheme or Social Welfare Case, which resulted in the making of the first federal industrial award in the community services sector in 1985 and opened the way for the first time for the making of federal awards in other sectors such as teaching, nursing, firefighting and many others. So it was quite historic. When that award was made, and subsequent federal social and community services awards were being made, there was a great deal of commentary about how the sky would fall in, about how it would be impossible to pay fair wages and provide decent conditions. I even appeared in a hearing in the, in the Federal Commission in New South Wales to be cross-examined by employers' representatives about the outrageous prospect that they would be required to provide toilets for their staff as a condition of an industrial award. <coughs> In the end, and after a great deal of protracted and difficult negotiation and implementation, fairer wages and conditions were provided and the sky didn't actually fall in. Governments came some considerable way to the party, organisations adjusted their services and staffing and found other sources of revenue. There's no doubt, and I strongly agree with Peter, it's absolutely imperative that something happens to significantly increase wages in the sector because the sector is losing its ability to recruit and ret retain it, the people it needs to do its work. So there's, something's got to give. One of the, but however, one of the sector's problems of its own making, in part at least in this regard, is that services funded by governments have been way underpriced and that funds that have been accepted to deliver them have been historically too low. And the pay equity case to also bring some of those chooks home to roost, as I say. Last week I had lunch with the Chief Executive of the Association of Chief Executives of Voluntary Organisations in the UK, who's now Sir Stephen Bubb. And I'm going, um, this is by way of an aside to Peter, he has a blog of his own. But there's another blog which is a spoof of his blog. Um, <laughs> And I'll send you the links, you might want to put them on your web page, and I suspect the spoof is written by the author of the other blog, actually. <laughs> but that organisation has been running a campaign they call Full Cost Recovery, trying to educate the sector about how it needs to properly price yeah. its services so that it can inform government what they really cost. We haven't done that in Australia. Without knowing the outcomes, and I, I would guess my guess about what, the, what Fair Work Australia would do would be somewhat less than yours mm. because I think wages were historically low in Queensland and so 37% might be towards the upper end of the, the spectrum. But they will award significant increases, one imagines. But I think it's important to point out a couple of things. As you said, Peter, the Commonwealth and the ASU have, have asked that they be phased in over five years with the first instalment not, uh, not before six months after any decision. So if it is decided in mid this year, the earliest for a first instalment would be early next year, 2012, with future instalments through to mid 2016. And even with the 440 million that was put in in Queensland, there were significant reductions in service as a consequence of that money not being enough or not being directed to services which were only partly or not, yeah. un, not at all funded by government. But I think, but more importantly, once, once some of that is settled and, we, and the difficult negotiations with government and others have taken place about how it will be managed and phased in, if the sector's then to keep up, we need to set a framework for further adjustment based on enterprise bargaining as happens in all, all the other sectors, not an, an equal pay case now and then nothing that actually gets, gets the sector to where it needs to go. And I think there's a, a compelling argument in that context for something that we might, rather than funding of wage increases, there are issues about services that the sector delivers on behalf of government that are arguably government services that government should fully fund and those other sorts of services that governments might support but might choose to not fully fund. The Productivity Commission explored that space a little bit. But I think there's a compelling case not for funding for wage, uh, wage increases, but something that we might, as our colleagues in other sectors, term an industry adjustment package. 
something that helps the sector adjust to a completely different way of doing things. Um, and finally, I'd say there's quite a lot of um, debate and discussion about possible productivity offsets to meet these kinds of wage increases. And I, I'll just finish by saying there's not that much blood left in that stone, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, David. It was great. Um, I'm now going to ask uh, Paul um, from the Brotherhood of St Lawrence to give his views. Going back to the days when I was working with David, it's fair to say that the Brotherhood of St Lawrence were uh, quite distinctive among many of the large not-for-profit organisations in being very hesitant indeed about seeking work under Job Network. I think the Brotherhood was always more cautious of this relationship. Um, so, Paul, what are your views now and what's likely to happen out of this? Thank you very much, Peter. I, was, I wasn't at the Brotherhood in, uh, back in, in those years, but I've, I've, I've certainly well informed on the, the period and, and the position they took. But I would, I'd rather begin just mm. first uh, from a slightly different starting point. I really appreciated the opening comments which showed how this question of a wage rise for a small number of people on a little uh, sector of the labour market uh, it's actually it's such a, a big issue uh, mm -hmm. when you start to, to think it through, like, like the dimensions of what it, what it stands for and yeah. why it is so important. And uh, I think, uh, for, I think for, for the Brotherhood and the way we're approaching uh, 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 issues of, of, of poverty and disadvantage in Australia today, I'd say this really goes to the, like the heart or the fault line. Uh, of where, as a nation, we really need to be rethinking our economic and social policy. Why are these people paid so poorly? It's because for so long we have undervalued care, right, and care workers. And um, so I think uh, uh, it, it's time, I know Ken Henry and, and, and uh, Ross Garneau and people I think we're all terribly complacent. We need to get back to big scale economic reform. I think it's time we included in that agenda big scale social reform and this case is emblematic of it. So I think uh, just briefly, it, 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 we need to revalue care if we're going to have a fair society and the people who work in those industries get their fair share of the national prosperity. So that's the first point. I think in our inclusive growth agenda, uh, we're also aware these days that investments in care aren't sort of add-ons, optional uh, extras, but uh, from the early years through, we now should know through our national reform agenda that spending in quality care uh, for, 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 you know, for in, in our citizens is a big economic as, as well as a social investment. So I think let's uh, put this in that big frame of a new approach to economic and social policy, which integrates them around inclusive growth. And I think out of that, we can then also have a really good discussion about the different sectors and who's best place uh, to, uh, to do that, um, that care work in our society. I'll be happy to join in on, on that uh, issue when we get to discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Paul and uh, Julie from the uh, uh, Jesuit Social Services. Thank you, and um, I'll probably pick up um, uh, where you left off, um, Paul, which is, yes, for me the overriding question is what do we value as a community? And I say that in terms of both mm. the nature of that work and that, and that care, but I think beneath that is whom do we value as a community? And you just have to look at the her page uh, one and eight of the Herald Sun today, uh, which was talking about certain um, suburbs, in a sense, bleeding us dry and people um, uh, on all number of benefits, etc., and uh, with a very um, blaming approach, uh, um, I, I read it as, to, to those people. Um, so I think that's a, a starting point. Um, I can recall many years ago when... Um, I was talking to a young person who was an engineer and was uh, working in the field of bringing um, boats into port. And I know that if a, a boat carrying oil or anything else like that crashed, it would be a disaster. But he was 30 and I, at the time, was talking to someone who was um, 50 who was organising um, uh, for the whole of the western suburbs uh, adoption, uh, child, all the child protection um, 
uh, cases in terms of the services that were being offered, uh, foster care, out of home placements, etc., and who was probably on a third of the salary, um, and it was a really indicative to me. I remember from that time, which was was many years ago, what we value as a community. Um, I suppose just to um, to move on, I suppose want to say that um, uh, increasingly, what we our sector is picking up is uh, more complex work, more complex tasks, and that's associated with a range of of things in terms of. Um, what from and has been for a while in terms of deinstitutionalisation right through to um, long-term and entrenched disadvantage which has been perpetuated in certain communities etc. So what we need is a really talented and skilled and committed workforce. Um, what we've got is a workforce that's bleeding. Um, I've noticed over the years that I've been involved many of the people who my colleagues or um, peers years ago uh, who came into this sort of work have um, defected. Um, they've defected to, and I understandably, to other or other arenas. They've um, gone back mm. and studied law, or they're doing medicine, or they're um, psychologists in private practice. Uh, but what we have, so what we're seeing is our sector being um, bled dry. But what we do have, though, is the reality that people who come into our sector um, come because of their heart, become because of really strong vocation. Uh, to work with people who are the most disadvantaged and to offer the very kind of care that, that uh, Paul was talking about. And I think um, they're doing that on behalf of government at times or the broader community. Uh, and I think there's a case to be made for, to say that uh, at best that vocational uh, and heart response is being eroded and at worst you could say it's being exploited um, because of the... Uh, poor remuneration that they get. Um, just a couple of things I want to say before concluding, which is that we, you know, one of the reasons, and even if we just look within our government and non-government sector, we know that an entry level social work one uh, position in the government sector is paid 23% higher than it is in the community service sector. A social work four position in the uh, government is paid 47% higher than in the community sector. So these are just some um, inequities that are quite obvious that we can see that within our sector. And also it's been mentioned about the number of uh, females, 77% the ASU puts it at in terms of their membership uh, in our sector are female. Um, we know that women learn less than men in May 2009, full-time female earnings were 83% of men's and when we include part-time work that gets reduced to just 65% of the male figure. So you add those things to the fact the increasing complexity of clients, the increasing accountability from our funding bodies, I think that's something else that we need to talk about that takes our time, that is quite demanding, uh, which is fine, but we need to be able to attract and retain a quality workforce in order to uh, make sure we can perform at that level. Um, I think I, I just finished then, I suppose, by saying that we need to um, probably educate the broader community as well as government and philanthropy, etc., around this because it'll be our donors as well. And uh, we, you know, with this ac um, accountability, which says, you know, where does every cent go? And unless it's into direct service, well, guess what? Unless there's someone doing the payroll and unless there's someone doing the HR, we can't run quality services. So I think we need to look at those things as well. So just to conclude, I'd come back to what matters. What do we care about? What do we value as a community? And I think um, that's evidenced in terms of whom we pay, how do we remunerate them, what kind of conditions they're in, etc. So I think it's fundamentally an issue of justice. Thank you so much, Julie. So I think we've opened it up. Let me just say one other opening remark, because inevitably we will focus a little bit on what is going to be the response to governments who outsource the delivery of human services to these not-for-profit organisations. Not surprisingly, when we now know in a year about $26 billion of government money goes directly to not-for-profit organisations, increasingly to deliver its services. And it's obvious that one thing we will focus on, will, will government step in to supplement any increase, or better still, Will it actually then look at meeting the full costs of delivery? But of course, just about every organisation 
that does have a service agreement with Commonwealth or state governments to deliver services also delivers a whole range of its services without government support, dependent on philanthropic donation and volunteering. And those areas as well are going to be affected by, let us say, a 30% increase and have the challenge of how to respond to that. So you can see with this decision coming down in July, let us say, June or July, I think this really is that you know, a potential turning point in terms of how we look at the community sector. I think at the moment it's really travelling along you broadly below the radar. But my suggestion to you is in a few months' time, this is going to become a really significant issue. So, questions or comments to our panellists? Throw it open. Starter. Yeah. I'm curious. So can we, can we please use the microphone just for the camera record? Thank you. I'm from an uh, organisation called Brainwave. We uh, work looking after paediatric brain injury in, in children. Yeah. So I'm curious about the comment about productivity, about not much blood being left in the stone. Yet if you look at the structure of not-for-profits across Australia as an industry, there's in excess of 20,000 who are registered with the tax office with the appropriate status. There is surely an argument for a lot of duplication. So when the industry is being viewed by academics or government, who really should be at the table to talk about the fragmentation across the not-for-profit industry? Because there is a lot of duplication and there is potentially some waste at a structural level that could be taken out of the system. That is great that we have someone put the question. In fact, when we were in Sydney, um, it came in anonymously via tweet, but it was essentially the same question. If, it, if you're thinking there's a problem here and you're looking at productivity, why isn't there a bit of, this is a bit going a bit beyond you, a bit of M&A activity in here, that if you didn't have so many organisations that it would be possible to run more efficiently and get productivity? Your views? Um, you go, well, Okay, Julie. I'll just kick it off by saying I suppose it depends on uh, well, one aspect of it would be what do you think a community... I don't like calling them not-for-profits anyhow, but a community service organisation, what's its essential character and purpose? And um, I think uh, I'd be open to looking at those sorts of cost savings, but often when people have gone down that path, uh, what's happened is we've talked about mergers and increasingly bigger organisations um, for to get the economies of scale. What I'd be concerned about with that is that a community service organisation um, exists not just actually to provide services. That's one of the things it does, but it, it gets a good quality of community service because it's engaged with its local community. And um, therefore, to have a very um, a multiple um, uh, service provider or community sector organisation is really important. Um, often, the need and small size organisations are able to be nimble and fleet-footed and responsive in a way that if we're to get those economies of scale, depending on what we're talking about, we could perhaps share some back office things. I'm, I, I'm open to looking at those things. But I'm just saying the answer isn't just to get a few like the big four, and yeah. that's it. It is, I think, true that when we think of scale, if I'm in a private sector gathering, people will tend to be broadly thinking about you know, merger and acquisition. Yet, if you think about scale in this sector, to a very large extent, it can take place through collaboration and consortia, a quite different way. And David, obviously, you've been involved in sort of creating those consortia where you, in a sense, get the benefit of economies of scale, but without actually um, just reducing the number of community organisations. Um, yes, Peter, and just to, to sort of follow on, I agree with everything Julie said. We, uh, there aren't the conditions in the, in the non-profit sector for the sort of M&A activity that happens in the commercial sector because we're not for sale. It's, it's not a question of buying organisations out or having the resources to create incentives to get organisations to vacate the field um, in the same, as, same way as the private sector. There is certainly some scope for rationalisation in one way or another through collaboration, um, through, in some cases, organisations going to bigger scale. 
but I think there's a fair bit of evidence to suggest that if it's impact you're on about, you've got to have the, the qualities and characteristics that Julie's talking about, being connected to and responsive to the communities that, that are being served. Um, the other thing I'd say about it, my, my remarks about productivity were more about the productivity of the workers rather than the organisations. That's where I think the, we can't get much more blood out of the stone. Um, and I think if we're going to undertake that sort of, the pursuit of more cooperation, collaboration, the going to scale by getting, by getting a lot of smaller organisations working in concert rather than disappearing in a, bigger, in a bigger space, then that's going to take time and resources. And that's the sort of thing that might happen in a proper structural adjustment package for the sector. But isn't one of the arguments, with three of you representing very well-known tradition, work, good tradition, larger organisations or consortias, that actually you will be able to address this okay. You have got the scale, you've got the reserves, but it is in fact those smaller community organisations that may only have one, two or three paid workers who are going to really do it tough in this environment. Well, we've actually got a different problem in that employment services are not included in the community services award. Yeah. So we'll be competing against community services that are paying more money to be able to re recruit and retain our own workforce. And I shared with Peter a scary statistic earlier. One of my, one of my staff is undertaking some academic research which includes a, a survey of frontline workers in Australia's Job Services Australia Employment Services System. The, server, uh, the sample size is 839. They are dealing with increasingly disadvantaged and people with complex disadvantaged mental health, etc. So 839 workers, the highest education level of 77% of those people is high school. So the, something happens when things get too cheap. Services get too cheap. Cool. I think uh, the Brotherhood of St Lawrence perspective on, on that would be in order. We did a lot of thinking about, uh, in line with what Julie was just talking about, about what is the role of the not NGOs or not for profits uh, that's distinctive. Uh, we all want a governance regime where the different sectors are able to capitalise on their strengths and bring that to the table. And uh, I think we were confirmed in uh, what Peter Shergold was saying in the wisdom of not going down the path of trying to grow the big business into some big uh, conglomerate service provider for government, as the opportunity might have presented back in the 90s, where we sensed the danger of what you call a bit of mission drift. Mm. And so for us, it's been very important to hang on to what we see as the distinctive thing we bring to the table, not large scale service. I, mean, the, I think the bureaucrats probably beat us at that, if there's one size fits all large scale service delivery. But what they can't beat us at is the, the representation of the interests of disadvantaged people through our advocacy uh, and through all that all intricate community development work we do uh, in bringing uh, you know, people in, into the system who they may not be paid employees at all, they just want to get involved in issues and helping people. So I think that advocacy and that community development thing, if we're saying what we want the NGOs people to bring to the table, let's focus on that. And uh, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm open-minded about the big providers, uh, the big corporatised ones, uh, if, that, if they can do it uh, as well as, uh, or cheaper than government, there's probably a role for it, but we shouldn't really confuse that with uh, being a, a true blue civil society representative NGO. Very good, yes. Okay. Yeah, it's on its way. Thank you, Jack Kavanagh from Family Life, a community service organisation in Melbourne. Um, I thank you, Julie, for framing it um, as a social justice issue and drawing attention to the issue of um, that might be about who we are caring for that um, matters in the discussion as well. Um, and I want to um, just draw attention to the value of the community sector that has been demonstrated in the post-disaster areas in Australia, first in the bushfires in Victoria and now in the floods um, this, this year. And it is the community organisations that have been able to organise quickly 
to deliver that value that isn't part of purchasing services, where you can actually mobilise people to get involved and help each other, not for a dollar, but because we're a community and a society. And if we don't maintain that community infrastructure as part of this whole funding discussion, then we may not have that capacity to respond in the future. And we might find ourselves in the situation that New Orleans was in with post-Katrina, without a community infrastructure, so that many years down the track, they're still trying to rebuild. And it's interesting to note that in the bushfire recovery in Victoria, although the unit price for family services that are provided for vulnerable and disadvantaged families is 92000 for a full-time worker, in the bushfire recovery, the money we were offered immediately was 120000 a full-time worker to uh, assist the people affected by the bushfires. So again, who are we trying to help actually matters in this too, in terms of the value that is then placed on our services. And at one level, the government brain knows it, but at another level, they don't have to apply it. And I do think part of that's to do with the way the community sector deals with the issue. But we do need to pick up this social justice issue about it's quite fund and that it's fundamental to our society to be able to organise as a community and have people on the ground who know how to do that. Julie, do you want to respond? Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> Other comments and questions? Yes. Bryce Craig's from Scope. Um, a couple of things. Firstly, congratulations. I mean, you, you, you're right on the money in regards to uh, issues such as, I think the term was uh, industry adjustment package. Back in um, 2009, uh, DHS did the Price Waterhouse People's Funding Review for Pricing Review for Disability Services. And what they found was that um, there was certainly underfunding in the sector between 12 and 45% of certain services. They also found a few other things that aren't necessarily publicised, um, such as how the sector is actually compensating for that by under delivery, etc., etc. Also, the fact that there wasn't much fat in the system at all, and the only areas for efficiency gains was in back office service provision. Um, certainly, they couldn't find at the coalface any areas that they could actually find savings in. Um, certainly, the value proposition between us and the people we serve is in that intimacy. However, there's organisations such as SCO that are large enough to have a back office service capacity, and we've invested heavily in that. Um, there's no mechanisms currently to enable us to offer that easily to other organisations and for other organisations to accept that easily. Um, there is no incentives, as there is in other countries like Canada, where they work on consortium models. They don't each invest in a client management system. Mm -hmm. One organisation provides a client management system that's fully secure, and others use it much cheaper. But it just doesn't seem to happen here. There isn't enough um, incentive and encouragement for the sector to work together to find out how to get more efficient in the way it delivers services. Now, from Scope's point of view, the more people that use our systems, the cheaper at a unit price level it is for me to deliver those systems to our organisation. So therefore, I can provide better value to our organisation and they can provide better value to the clients. It works all the way around. Who would like to? Oh, Dave, so, oh, Julie, quick, that would be great. Sorry. Dave. Yeah, no, Julie. Go. Oh, just a quick response is, yes, I think we can look at, at models for that. I think we've be, because of the competitive environment that we've um, been operating in, um, I think that uh, it makes it difficult for us to come together. I, think, I was just talking about someone uh, to someone about this recently, that um, we've been in a consortia with a, a few people, a few other organisations, I mean, and that's going to be fragmented as governments changing the new uh, tender, the tender specifications for the new round, which is going to force us into other partnerships. We're happy to be in partnerships, but the way that it's being done is we will now end up competing, actually, for the work with people we've been in partnership with. I just said, what does it mean about our intellectual property? And I was just talking uh, uh, to someone saying, you know, if this were commercial, a commercial enterprise, 
you know, we wouldn't be doing this because they are models of care. There's, you know, in terms of what we what we would, um, uh, you know, how we would outline that we believe is our is is um, what sets us apart, and the others would believe that about themselves too. So I think that's um, something that mitigates against it. I think the other thing is, how do you do that stuff? It takes time, and I think the other th all these partnerships or consortium take time. We actually aren't funded to do, or have the capacity to take the time often to do that that sort of work. But I, I'm not against it. I just think there are some of the things that are uh, factors that are disincentives. Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm Lauren Matthews from VCOS and I'm the Partnership and Community Sector Policy Analyst there. So um, I think that's right, Julie, and, and building on from what Joe and Bryce have been saying as well, is that um, partnership is often seen by government and I think by our sector ourselves as a cost neutral activity. And it's not calculated as part of the unit price. It's not part of any sort of funding agreement negotiation, any grant application that we're putting in. And I think that that's something that we as a sector need to work on is what's the value of partnership and how do we work on it? And it's really interesting looking at partnerships from a COS network perspective and in that kind of different role in that I look after the formal partnering arrangements between government and the community sector. So we've had one for 10 years here in Victoria with DHS and we've had one for the last year with the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development. But um, we're on that journey as well with everyone else. So at the moment we're doing developing a resource. We've done some around building a partnership, but now we're doing one about what do you do when you're in a partnership? How do you break up a partnership? What do you do with intellectual property issues and all of that? Because we're really along that journey and I think it, we're keen as VCOS to use that work to build into um, how can we look at shared services? We're getting common funding agreements with government, partnerships on the table. So how can we include discussions around shared services as for the back of office stuff so that we as a sector can continue to have diversity and continue to grow. I just had a couple, one other thing is that um, ACOS is working on advocating around an industry adjustment package as part of the pay equity case. So um, watch this space around that work of ACOS and I know David's been involved in that yeah. with us as well. And also around unit pricing. I think that's often a really big and controversial issue and the, the amount that was given to organisations during the bushfires was actually the price that family service providers and government agreed upon before the bushfires about what it costs for service delivery and as part of the um, the pay equity case, some sector organisations and ourselves and DHS are working together to go through the unit prices to work out how much it's going to cost and what unit prices are going to look at. So it's certainly on the table and as a sector we really need to join together in a united voice to have those discussions. We're here, here. I should say that whilst I would urge you all to go onto the CSI website, look at the blog that I've written and respond to it. I also urge you strongly to go and look at the ACOS site because they have been running a very valuable uh, information campaign about this case and its implica implications, which is just great. Thank you. David. Um, I think it's actually quite difficult for government to partner, certainly with individual community organisations. You, in previous discussions, have referred to the huge asymmetry in the power relationship in those things. Um, but I think there is a lot of merit in organisations like VCOS and other organisations like that actually bringing, bringing a lot of, of organisations together. And um, the head of one of the biggest departments in Victoria said to me um, towards the end of last year, it never ceased to amaze him how easy it is for them to purchase services at far less than what they reasonably would cost yeah. if they paid full tote odds, simply because the sector doesn't organise itself. Yeah. And I think that is another challenge with the size of the sector that was pointed out, that one of the difficulties is many of the organisations who are now very well organised and do know what the costs of producing outputs and outcomes are, mm, yeah. often find themselves tendering against organisations that are new to the field and don't know that. And the difficulty is that government, which is not meant to be looking for cheapness, but is meant to be looking for value for money, unfortunately often mistakes the two. Cool. Uh, yeah, on the question of cheapness and uh, like the way people are talking, it sounds like there's going to be a lot of extra money in the system to uh, pay people well and uh, have good careers. 
So I'm, I'm just wondering, are we, is Australia really ready uh, for the extra money and the extra investment? Because I think part of the decline into sort of cheapness, cheap services for poor people that uh, we've seen is uh, as evidenced by the, the way people are paid in this industry, the low paid care workers, is as a society, we haven't really placed much of a value on care and the world of care and the people who work in that world. So I think there's, uh, uh, in, in trying to get up a much more progressive agenda uh, and a nation that's willing to uh, organise itself around a, a thriving world of care as well as a thriving economy, uh, I think uh, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's some real uh, basic reorientation uh, of, of priorities has to take place. Yeah. Now I'm going to ask our panel, who I think are getting off lightly here, one really tricky question which I'd like their views on. And it goes back to the Queensland decision. Because as you heard, the Queensland government did step in and provide additional funding. Perhaps not sufficient, but $414 million. But here's the rub. Uh, they provided it across a range of community organisations. And to take an example that's been in the press, um, Mission Australia got a substantial amount of the funding. Mission Australia did absolutely nothing wrong and has been very open about this. But here's the rub. Mission Australia actually had very few workers who were in the sector that, in fact, was subject to the Queensland equal pay decision. All their workers in that sector were already on above award wages and they operate, not surprisingly, national. So they set national standards. So the government gave them the money and they have used it on salaries. But they have not used it to increase the salaries of the workers in Queensland because that wasn't part of what the Queensland government required. So my question to you three, let's say you've got a generous government, Commonwealth government, Victoria government, is going to step in to supplement the sector. I'd like to know how you're going to distribute the money. David. <laughs> I think it's actually quite difficult because I, I don't, I don't think governments will understand or necessarily know about all they fund or where yeah. they fund it from or that which they fully fund or think they fully fund that which they partly fund that which they fund that's a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit there um, it won't, it's not going to be a simple exercise yeah. so the um, the only flaw I can see in the Queensland example you gave is the transparency about what happened was after the event and perhaps not before it. But I suspect there needs to be a, a really thoroughgoing effort to try, and, to try and actually map out all the services and for then governments to work out and to, to be quite clear about what it is they are going to be prepared to pay for and some, some sort of mechanism for reviewing and looking back at that after the event as well. I was involved in a massive exercise following the CIS case in 1985, which had people translated from all sorts of non-award wages into a system which had to be managed nationally. It was incredibly complex and took about three years. So. Well, here's my problem, Paul. Let's say we've got two community organisations here in Victoria one is paying above award rates and one is not. There's then an increase in award rates. Are you going to say when you distribute the government funding that it should only go to the one that is on the award rates and then penalise, therefore, the one that was paying the above award rates or you're going to give equal amounts to each? It's a bugger, isn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It really raises... so. I mean, this is actually probably the most wicked element of this public policy issue. In various ways, I am pretty certain myself, you will see governments respond. In WA, I think it will be ahead of the pack because the Premier has made it clear that there will be a down payment on increased funding for community organisations in, in the budget. But it's facing exactly the same dilemma of how you actually distribute this funding across the sector. And it is very difficult and it needs to be something that we need to think, as a sector, think through in terms of providing the advice to government. 
Is, yeah, I'll open mine just good. Good. Uh, asking, because I, I wasn't aware of that. Um, are you saying, Peter, that um, rather than it be like a two, three, whatever percent broadly applied increase, government has chosen to fund some agencies above others? No. Well, in fact, Queensland, they predominantly did the opposite. They said, here is the increase, there's a percentage increase, and we will distribute it to community organisations, I think broadly on the scale of the organisation. Uh -huh. But then, Mission Australia, who accepted the money, found themselves under criticism because, in fact, they didn't have many workers in that area, they weren't employed under that award, and they were being paid above award rates anyway, so they took the money and they used it for salaries, but in fact not in the way that others anticipated. So that's why it's important we think this issue through in advance. But to do it the other way, then the organisations who have been more generous in their payments, who have paid above awards, get worried that they will be penalised. Yeah, sorry. That would be um, a different scenario because we're based on unit pricing. So everyone's unit, those who are on funding and service agreements who are deliver ongoing programs, their un the unit price for everyone would increase. So regardless of what rate you pay, in Victoria the rise will flow through to everyone. So there'll be actually no difference in how that works, if that makes sense, because of the way we do unit no. costs. I do, and that's one of the ways it can be done, just on unit pricing. But then there will be an argument, which I know will run. And you, the made, decision may be made, but I have talked to many public servants who say, well, why would we be paying additional money as unit yeah. pricing to organisations that are able to do this and deliver a surplus as they are now? So, I mean, I think all these issues are going to have to be thought out. And I suspect, in part, it will also be partly... There's got to be some, I think, upfront payment in some way, and some of it will be done then as contracts are renegotiated. And we've yeah. had, uh, can I just make, oh, we have had versions of it, haven't we? Haven't we? Where, yeah. For example, two or three percent or whatever has been passed on, and some organisations, I mean, different organisations have dealt with it differently. Some have passed it on to those positions that were funded, whatever. Some have said, okay, it's going to be the equivalent rather than everyone get three. We've worked it out that it's 1.8 for all. You know, so you might be funded through philanthropy, you might be funded in that, so that we internally keep some kind of parity. Uh, yeah, so there, there are issues that are going to arise. Yes, I'll take this as the final question, if that's okay, and then we'll carry on the discussion afterwards. Uh, it's actually a follow-on from that point. Doesn't that really come back to the whole issue of, of properly costing services? And if, and if the government is not prepared to pay what that service costs, and at the moment, the organisation is having to go and supplement that through philanthropy and corporate partnerships and fundraising. Why should that organisation be penalised mm. when finally the services are properly costed mm. and that money is available from the government? I think that those organisations should then have that money freed up to spend on other services. Yeah. I think that's, I just want to draw the distinction between services that government might fund because they see them as government services which they might attach a unit cost to. Uh, and then there's another bunch of services that agencies deliver that governments see fit to support in some shape or form. That's a very different proposition. And I think there's a very difficult question of um, um, whether not rewarding an organisation, whether compensating an organisation for an increased cost is the same thing as not rewarding it. Yeah. But I think even in the case where it's supporting it, they will have been supporting that organisation for the cost of a program or an initiative, whatever it is, based on the cost of the staff who actually deliver that. So whether it's a unit cost or it's supporting that program for whatever it was, it was designed to be, now, if the cost of that increases, then that's what it but is. But I'm thinking about well, something like for the whole non-profit non sector, and this is a smaller subset, uh, only about 30 to 40% of its revenues come from government. Uh, there's a huge proportion that's, generate, that's generated from fee-for-service and um, donations and then other, other contributions significant in Victoria in particular made by philanthropy. And I think there are some questions about where do the, where do the gaps from that, how do those gaps get filled as well? And they're probably larger. Paul, I know you have to make a dash to go teaching, but have you got any final comments before you have to beat your retreat? 
Oh, that was sudden. Uh, the uh, oh well, I think uh, 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 one of the, I had a, a, having been uh, around the place for many years. One of the uh, interesting things I had to, to do was a little research pro project on the history of the sector, and it was very interesting to notice how the uh, like the way we think about these issues in Australia is very much conditioned by our history, and. Um, and so, unlike some countries which have gone down the path of properly publicly funded services and the area of care and so on, um, uh, our history has been more of one of, uh, well, let's leave it to the family, let's leave it to individuals, let's leave it to the community. We want to have a strong, voluntary sector. And uh, I think this, this is what this, from this, group, this big dilemma we're facing now is a, it's a dilemma for all of our society. Um, that uh, uh, women having gone into the, into the labour market, into the workforce over the decades, uh, we just don't have the, the, uh, the capacity in terms of traditional voluntary sector sources uh, for, for that kind of solution where it's outside government and done on some voluntary principle. So I think uh, to me the big question is uh, are we going to finally bite the bullet and, uh, and fund these things properly uh, and, and then we can work out whether we do it directly through government or indirectly through our voluntary uh, part sector partners. Thank you. Uh, Julie, your concluding um, comments. Yes, I think it probably uh, ties in with the last question and the question that um, I'm hearing, even if it hasn't um, been uh, spoken overtly, which is around uh, the use that an organisation and the choices that an organisation might make about the money or the uh, resources that it has, as it has at its disposal. I heard that through the Mission Australia kind mm. of example there. But one of the things I suppose I'd say is that um, while organisations uh, deliver services uh, on behalf of, of government, community sector organisations existed in the main, many of them, long, long before, and will continue to exist, hopefully, into the future. And we're not the same as just being the arms and legs of government. And I think what's really important to say, and it's fair enough, well, government might say, well, okay, well, why, but why should we fund you? But I think for government and to have a strong civil society, it's important to recognise that when we have a strong community sector, we will have a stronger um, society, a stronger civil society and a stronger community. And it isn't solely just about this transactional thing about the delivery of services. It is actually about having people and organisations and places where there's a strong sense of mission and purpose and that this is valued in its own right and is safeguarded. If we come down to the big four or if we um, uh, lose a lot of the, the smaller organisations that have passionate people in there who've got in there because they have had a child with a disability or some passionate um, reason, uh, if we if we you know lose that, we're as a society, we are poorer, and I don't think the I think the example Joe gave around, um, you know, Katrina, etc., is a very good example of that. So I don't think it's just this transactional value that I think we've got to be careful of. And an organisation should be encouraged to maintain that autonomy or independence, rather than having it whittled down. And then we would be able to use some of those sources of funding, whether it be our donor support base or whatever, to do some of the creative problem solving innovative work that we exist to do, whereas at the moment we're using those funds to just keep us afloat and supplementing inadequate government funding. And David, you can have the final word. Um, we're not service providers. It's one of the things we do. Yes. Well, that's very well said. Look, I think it's been enough to realise that this is really going to be an interesting issue. At the Commonwealth level, we now have, after the first term of the Rudd-Gillard government, a national compact with its statement of principles as to how to improve the relationship between governments and the not-for-profit sector. We've got the national compact. We've now had recently established the Office of the Not-for-Profit Sector in Prime Minister and Cabinet and an Advisory Council created. In a very real way, this is going to be the first real test. How is that statement of principles going to survive and to influence the outcomes of the government's response to the Fair Work Australia case. 
because in a, that is, in a sense, going to be the proof of the pudding. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for our panel, David Thompson, Paul Smythe, Julie Edwards, who have done just what I wanted to facilitate discussion. Thank you so much for coming. Please stay in contact with us, and now please join us for drinks. Thank you very much. Thank you.